truth speakers, <coughs> all friends who are interested in the Dhamma, I'd like to welcome you here and express my joy that you have come to this place in this way, namely coming here for the sake of understanding and learning about Dhamma, which will enable us to develop our lives to higher and higher levels. First, we'd like to pause to consider why we've chosen this time to speak this early at 5 a.m. First of all, this is the time when most flowers open. Most flowers, flowers will open up around this time of day. It's the appropriate time for them to do so. In the same way, this is a time of day when it's easy for our minds to, to open like a flower. For this is the time when the Buddha was enlightened. At this time, the mind is fresh and flexible. It's easy for it to experience, to think, to be active to investigate. And so this is an appropriate time to investigate the Dhamma. This is the time of day when our teacups have yet to overflow. There's still room to pour something new into our teacups. And so this is why we've taken the opportunity to speak at this time. Although it may be a bit difficult for some, please consider the various possibilities and realize that the advantages far outweigh the, the difficulties. As we begin, please put aside all thoughts or attitudes of comparison between Buddhism and other religions. All thoughts about Buddhism, Christianity, Hindu or whatever, please just put them aside. Instead of approaching things in the narrow way of this religion or that religion, instead let's focus on just one thing what we call <clears throat> nature or the truth of nature. Let's just focus on natural truth and put aside the distinctions and comparisons between the different religions. Or at least we should see the, try to see all the religions as one. For example, the Buddhists should see Christian prayer or other, the prayer to God, praying to God as it appears in various religions. Buddhists should see this as an attempt to practice correctly according to natural law, natural truth. We should observe that in that all people, all human beings, no matter what religion they follow, have the same problem. All of us have the problem of suffering, our pain, misery, suffering, or what we call dukkha. Whether we're Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, Jews, or whatever. All of us share the same problem of dukkha, of pain, of suffering. It doesn't matter what religion we follow. It's just 
in the same way that all of us have the same color blood. No matter what religion you follow, your blood is red. And in the same way, we all have shared the same problem. The, the problem of life for all of us is identical. There's we all view life in terms of self. We, we believe in a self, an ego that I am. And then we act selfishly. We consider ourselves to be a self and then act selfishly. And so this means all of us have the same problem. If we look carefully, we'll see that all of us have the same lofty goal in life. The highest goal of all religions is the same, which can be summarized in two words, blissful and useful. We all seek a happy, joyful, blissful life. And we all seek a life that is useful. So both blissful and useful is the common goal that all our religions share. But our lives can't be, are unable to be blissful and useful for one single reason selfishness. Because of selfishness, none of our lives are truly blissful or fully useful because of selfishness. But because this is understood, all the different religions work to eliminate selfishness. The methods and techniques differ. We go about this practice of eliminating selfishness differently. But we all see that we share the same goal and we see that the way to achieve a blissful and useful life is to eliminate selfishness. Selfishness is the, the basic cause of all our problems. And it's what keeps us from a life that is peaceful and useful. Selfishness causes all the problems in this world. When there is no selfishness, life is cool and peaceful, and it can be put to the highest use for the good of oneself and the good of the world. But when there is selfishness, life becomes hot inside. It starts to burn. Or we could say, <clears throat> when there is selfishness, life bites its owner. Selfishness is worse than a, than a dog. The dog will never bite its owner the way selfishness does. But we think that when we are selfish, we're thinking, selfishness is thinking is doing what's good for oneself. But in fact, selfishness is doing damage. It's harming itself, its owner. So this is why we seek, or we see the need to eliminate selfishness. To look in another way, 
when there is selfishness, we don't think of doing any benefit to others. We don't think of benefiting ourselves. We don't think of benefiting others. We don't think of benefiting the common good. When there's selfishness, we don't think of doing anything of benefit for anyone. And so our life is useless because it benefits no one, not even ourselves. What seems, what may seem strange to you about this is that selfishness not only is unable to do anything of benefit for others, selfishness prevents us from doing anything of benefit for ourselves. Because we misunderstand, we think that when we are being selfish, we're doing what's good for me, what's good for us. But in fact, when there is selfishness, we're not even doing what's right or beneficial for ourselves. For example, we often, one example of selfishness is laziness. When we're lazy, we, we refuse to do anything of value for others or for society. But we think we're doing something good for ourselves. But in fact, we're doing absolutely nothing of value for ourselves. We're just frittering away our, our lives. When we're lazy, we don't do anything for others. In fact, we harm others. And as well, we harm ourselves. This is how it is with selfishness. It not only harms others, it harms oneself. We, and when this problem, if selfishness grows and grows, if selfishness grows, if we're in such a habit of indulging in selfishness, then it gets worse. And if there's way too much selfishness, we become neurotic and eventually go crazy. All the people filling up our mental hospitals are there because of excessive selfishness. All insanity is a result of excessive selfishness. And when selfishness has reached this point, one's life has, one has wasted one's life. One's life is of no benefit, not even to one's, oneself. When there's too much selfishness, all we think of is taking. One doesn't think of, of giving. Or when there's selfishness, people just demand their rights. But they don't think at all of duties and responsibilities. So this is how selfishness harms others as well as ourselves. It may seem strange, but selfishness actually does us more damage than it does to anyone else. Now we'll consider, as well as we can, this life that we are aiming at, a life that is blissful and useful. We'll consider the life, the aspect of blissfulness or peacefulness. The life that is 
cool and at peace will have four characteristics. It will be clean, clear, calm, and free. It's clean because there's nothing dirty or defiling, um, messing up the mind. When the mind is, is clean, then it is clear, bright. It knows what it needs to know. It has a, a freshness and openness, a clarity. And when, when we know what we need to know, then there is the mind be, is very correct. There's a rightness to it. And then the mind is calm or peaceful. This mind is, is calm because there are no problems disturbing it. And so this is a life which is free. Free of all problems, free of all suffering or all dukkha that could trouble it. So when we consider the, the goal in terms of this coolness, peacefulness, we see, we can see a life that is clean, clear, calm, and free. Free here is the same as the goal of all religions. Free is to have escaped from or been liberated from all problems in life. All religions speak of salvation, emancipation, liberation which is the meaning of being to be free. And so this is the goal of all religions. Another name for this life which is which is clean, clear, calm and free is a cool life. The cool life but when we use the word cool here, we need to be careful of its meaning because we're not speaking of the ordinary cool that you think of in terms of, say, your body temperature. The ordinary cool is the opposite of hot. There's hot, and there's cold, there's warm, and there's cool. But we're talking now of a special kind of cool that doesn't have an opposite. A cool that isn't just the opposite of being hot or warm. But to understand this meaning of cool, of the cool life, we suggest another word, the word quenched. A life that is quenched, where all thirst, all hunger, all problems, all difficulties, all anxiety, worry, all the problems that surround us are quenched. This is the cool life. If you study it deeply, you'll see that in the word quenched, you'll find the meanings of the word clean, clear, calm, and free. 
All of these qualities can be found in the word quench. And further we can find relaxation in it as well. Most of what people take to be relaxation is not genuine relaxation unless this quality of being quenched is there. You can go to the beach, you can go to the mountains, you can do all the things that people try to do to relax, but unless inside we are quenched, that relaxation is is not very is very superficial and doesn't last. The real meaning of relaxation is only found in in being quenched. And so we should investigate this word and its meaning. In addition, this word quenched is one which we use for the highest thing in Buddhism. The supreme thing of Buddhism is called Nippon in Thai, Nibbana in the Pali language and Nirvana in Sanskrit. It's one word, but it's pronounced or has different forms in the different languages. Nibbana. And essentially, Nibbana is about being quenched. But normally, we just translate it as coolness, because it's an easy word, coolness. It's a popular one as well in in the tropics. But the, to really understand coolness, we must understand quenched. Because we're not speaking, because quenched is the coolness, which is neither hot nor cold. Quenched is the, the, the fullest meaning of coolness. So we should give our attention to this, to what it is to be quenched. <clears throat> so please be aware that in quenched, in being quenched, we find all the qualities of cleanliness, clarity, calm, and freedom. Further, you ought to know that if, if one is, if we are at one with God, if we are unified with God, if we enter the kingdom of God, or however you wish to phrase it, then we will receive this, the same thing. That is, we will be quenched. In Buddhist terms, we say we, one realizes Nibbana, one makes Nibbana real. The experience of Nibbana is made real and total. But the meaning of that is to be quenched, to be perfectly quenched which is the whether it is unity with God or realization of Nibbana, we should receive the same thing, to be quenched. Otherwise, what's, what's the point? What good is it to be unified with God if it doesn't quench us? Now, quenched has many levels. And the 
highest level of being quenched is where there is no positive and no negative. The highest quenching is totally free of positive and negative. That means there's nothing with any positive value or negative value which can disturb us, entice us, trick us, annoy us, trouble us, or be problems for us. In Buddhism, this is recognized as being the the highest potential for the human being to be quenched on the level where there is there is no more positive and negative to cause us problems. Please be aware of this in advance so that you know where you'll be arriving at one of these days. But now we are not quenched. We are unable to quench because of one particularly wicked, nasty, evil thing, namely selfishness. Because of selfishness, none of us are quenched. None of us are clean, clear, calm, and free. But all the religions of the world seek to eliminate selfishness in their different ways. All the different religions, no matter matter how high or low, how old or new, all of them seek to eliminate selfishness. Therefore, we must find some way to overcome selfishness so that we can be quenched, so that we can realize what we are meant to experience. So we must look and find some way of eliminating selfishness. One can't be a good Christian if one is selfish. If one is selfish, one can't love one's fellow human beings. And if you can't love other people, you're not a very good Christian. So we can't be good Christians if we are still selfish. And so therefore our, <clears throat> our problem, our task, is to remove selfishness so that we can become good Christians or whatever. We must find a way to remove selfishness so that we can be free of it. Even what we call culture in essence, seeks to overcome selfishness. The real meaning and purpose of culture is to overcome selfishness on the ordinary level of of worldly affairs. Culture is a means to control, limit, and overcome selfishness so that we can live together in this world peacefully with smooth and friendly relations. If we move up to the higher level of religion, then it seeks to eliminate selfishness totally. But we should appreciate that all cultures in this world, every culture, has its purpose in in limiting and overcoming selfishness 
so that we can live together in this world in peace. If we don't have culture, then there's no way that we can have peace in this world if there isn't a living, functioning culture. There will be no peace. There must be many ways and means to to eliminate selfishness. Just as we said there are many levels to to being quenched. In the same way we need there are many levels to ending selfishness. And further, in this world there are many different kinds of people. As you very well know, there are all kinds of different people from the the most foolish to not so foolish to average to intelligent to the most intelligent. There are many levels of people so there must be many different methods for eliminating selfishness. So there are many different ways. For example, for ignorant people, foolish people, there are all the different ways they have of making their minds at ease. All the different superstitious practices we can find around the world. These are for the foolish people who know no better. But still they have these ways to calm and quiet their minds so they can be at peace. Then on a higher level, there are the various beliefs a higher level of belief in in angels and heavenly powers, the gods or even a single god. For example, and then on this level, for example, one can one is taught to surrender one's life to God to give one's life to God, to give one's self, one's soul, to God. This, this is a way of ending self. This is actually a quite powerful way of ending selfishness for the people whose understanding is on that level. And then in Buddhism, Buddhism has its a per- particular way of all all its own. Buddhism in Buddhism the way to end selfishness is to realize the fact that there is no self in the first place. All selfishness comes from believing in that we are a self in believing that one is a self. But when we see the fact that that we are not self, then there is no way for selfishness to occur. So these are just a brief scale of the the potential from the most very foolish superstitious practices Uh, on one level to the use of wisdom on the highest level to realize that we are not self. There are these various methods. You should be very careful to choose the method which is appropriate to, to your own life. The center where you are staying has only has one primary purpose which has two aspects at this center we aim to to help everyone to understand on the deepest level possible 
that there is no self, that self is an illusion. All of us are living, but our lives are not self. And so we will study in particular the law of dependent origination or Bhaticca Samupada, which you will be hearing more about. Because this, if we study it properly, reveals very clearly and profoundly that life is not self. But even with this understanding, we keep recreating the self because of our ignorance or because of our instincts. Our instincts which are neither good nor bad but are ignorant in that they don't know any better. They do the best they can but our instincts are still ignorant and therefore we have an instinctual sense of self and then through the education and conditioning we receive as we grow up this is strengthened and the belief in self becomes stronger and just becomes a basic assumption of all experience. So we also, because this is so deeply, in, because it's both instinctual and deeply conditioned into all of us, this belief in self, we also must develop a means to, to be able to cut through all that conditioning. And so this is why we the second aspect of our purpose at this center is to, to practice anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing. This is to develop the mental sharpness to cut through our ignorance so that we can, our, the understanding of not-self, of our selflessness can then solve all our problems. Remember that all of our problems come from selfishness. But selfishness depends on a self, on the illusion or belief in a self. If we practice correctly, we have the understanding about not-self and we have trained our minds to the point where they can master all situations. Then we can live life without allowing the self to arise. We have no need of it. We aren't tricked into letting this illusion take over our minds. When there is no self, there is no selfishness. And when there is no selfishness, then all the problems disappear. So this is the purpose of the center where you are staying. And may this be the purpose, your purpose in, in staying there for this 10-day retreat. This, this, in essence, is what the retreat is about, to understand the fact that life is not self and to train the mind so that that understanding can have the highest and most profound benefit. The the highest wisdom of Buddhism is that all things are not self. 
โอซาเบดัมมาอานาตาดัมมา means thing with absolutely no exception all things are not self or not soul this is is crucial absolutely crucial in life to understand this Because all of our problems come from selfishness, which come from self, which comes from not realizing that all things are not self. So please be especially interested in this. Be committed to understanding and investigating it ever more deeply within the reality. Of your own lives. So now, coming here, then we need to have a means to understand as deeply as possible the fact that all things are not self. The highest dharma in Buddhism is that all things are. Anatta. Anatta means not self. Atta means self, the ego, the soul, the abiding entity that illusion leads us to believe we are. Buddhism points out most clearly that all things are not self. All things here leaves no exception. There's not even God or anything like that is an exception. We need to study this thoroughly from the deepest level to go as deep as we can down to the substratum or whatever you call it. On the deepest level, up through the successive stages of life, of our own lives, within us, to the highest level or the highest aspect of life. So the entire range of our lives, all the things that make up our lives and the world around us, we need to study this all to see that everything. Without any exception, is anatta or not self, not soul. So we can begin by looking on the deepest level, what you could call a substratum or something of that sort. On the deepest level of life. We have what are called the datus. The datus. This word's a little tricky to translate. It's usually translated as element, which we'll use here, but it's not a perfect translation. But as we go, maybe we'll find the meaning. If we look, the most basic level of life are the datus, the elements. There are six basic elements. There's the earth element, the water element, the fire element, air element, space element, and consciousness element. Now, don't think that we're arguing some primitive chemistry or something. When we speak of the earth element, we're not talking about lumps of soil. That's far too crude. When we speak of the earth element, we mean the quality or characteristic of, or we could say the earth element has the quality of taking up space. The earth is what has is takes up space or area. That which has area uses area is the earth element. 
the water element is the, has the quality of holding together or cohesion. The stickiness between things is the water element, that quality. The fire element has the quality of burning, meaning burning up the old and releasing the new. And so change, the quality of burning and changing, this is the fire element. And then the air element is gases as they evaporate or move. So the quality of the air element is movement. These are the four physical elements. Then there is the space element. The space element is the element of, of void, of voidness, in which other things can enter. In fact, this space element is the basis for all the other elements. If there wasn't space, there wouldn't be a place for the other elements. And then the sixth element is the element of, of knowing, of feeling, of experiencing, the element of consciousness, vinyata, vinyana datu, vinyana datu, the consciousness element. This is the mind element. The first four are physical totally physical, they're what can be known, but they aren't, they don't have the, the ability to know in themselves. The fifth element is neither mental nor physical, it's just space, it's neutral. And then the sixth element is mental, the mind, the conscious element which, which knows. These are the, the six basic elements are the substratum of all life, of your life, of our life. And if you look at them, take a good look at the earth element, and you'll see that it's not self. Look at it and you won't find a self or a soul anywhere in the earth element. The water element is the same, it's not self. And the same with the fire element, the water element, they're not self. The space element, it's neither body nor mind, here nor there. How could that be a self? And even the element of consciousness, is not self. If we study this basic substratum of life, we'll see that none of them are self, or all of them are not self. And if this is what our life is made up of, then our life is not self. So this is just one one way to examine and study life in order to realize that the self is an illusion and the reality is that all things are not self. So first we examine the datu, the elements, in order to see that they are not self. Then we must examine how, when these are compounded together into a life, in particular, each of our own individual lives, we must see that when the elements are compounded together into our lives, 
that these lives are still not self. If you take a bunch of things which are not self and put them together in a constantly changing, impermanent way, then what you get is still not self. This is what we'll look into further. When the elements begin to compound, to come together and interact, the things compounded are the sense organs, the inner sense bases, the eyes, there are six, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind, the mind that functions as a sense organ. But the elements also compound together to make sense objects, forms that are seen, sounds that are heard, smells that are smelled, odors that are smelled, flavors that are tasted, physical sensations which are touched, and mental objects which are known, experienced, felt, thought, and so on. Without these objects, the inner sense bases have no meaning. They only have meaning together. And so the elements compound together and then we have the senses, the sense organs and the sense objects. All of these are called the ayatana, the six inner ayatana and the six outer ayatana. Ayatana means a means of communication or a medium, or in this case, since there are twelve media, they're the sense media, or we can just say the media are the means of communication. And all of these media are not self. Examine the, the way the, the eyes work, the sense of sight. It, it just functions. If we, if we examine it, we'll see that there are processes that occur. It just functions. And that functioning of the sense of sight requires no self, no master or, or little god or something looking over it. The same is true for the sense of hearing of smell, of taste, of touch, and the mental sense. This is possible because the elements are the most basic functions. And they function, that's their meaning, that they function in such and such a way. The six different qualities we talked about because they function like that when they compound together and we get the higher level of complexity of the media, those media still function. These different things functioning as seeing, smelling, and hearing, and so on. And none of that requires any self or soul or something to control it or own it or anything like that. So the first thing to do is to study in life, not study intellectually, but study in life how the six elements are not self. And then to study how when the elements com combine, compound into the ayatana, the sense media, that these sense media are not self. Now you can see quite clearly that everything, 
everything that we, all worlds, all, all worlds that we could go to or have been to or could think of, all things that we can experience without any exception, everything that we can think of, all realms, all possibilities, are contained in the word sense object. We say the, the outer media, the sense object. This includes all possible worlds. No matter how you construe the meaning of that to be. All mental worlds, physical worlds. All possibilities are included in the word outer media, the sense object. Is anything that you could ever see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or conceive of, anything that could enter your mind is included in the outer media, the sense object. And then we have the inner ayatana, the sense organ. When these two interact, then everything appears. All the things, all the experiences that make up our lives appear through the interaction of the sense organs and the sense objects, the eyes and forms, the ears and sounds, and so on, up through the mind and mental objects. The whole world appears in this way. So there are these two pairs of six. Please try to remember them. The first six, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind sense, the mind as a sense organ. And the second pair are forms, sights, the forms, sounds, odors, flavors, touches, and mental objects. So there are two sets of six. That's all there is. There aren't seven or eight. It's clearly limited to six. <clears throat> now these two sixes, these outer and inner media, interact and compound, condition, concoct up into all kinds of different things. As a result of the interaction of these media, there is the compounding and concocting of all incredibly different sorts of things. So we ask that you patiently um, stay with us and listen as we describe explain some of the ways that things are compounded, concocted out of the interaction of these media. You may not be able to memorize it all, but please listen. When we have these two sets of media or ayatana, when they come together and interact, they don't all at once, all six, nothing about, but when one of each, when one pair interacts, there arises something new. And so we say through the interaction of the inner media and the outer media, there arises various things associated with the ayatana or dependent upon the ayatana. So when they first interact or intermix, the, there arises these six vijnana or the six consciousnesses, the six kinds of sense conscious consciousness. Because here consciousness means to know a sense object via one of the ayatana. 
just as there are six sense organs, six kinds of sense objects, then there are six kinds of sense consciousness, knowing forms, knowing sounds, knowing odors, knowing flavors, knowing touches, and knowing mental objects. Next we come to a fourth group. When, when there is the inner sense organs, the outer sense bases, they interact and then there arises consciousness, then the fourth group is called contact, or in Pali, patsa, patsa, or contact. When the inner sense organ interacts with the outer and then consciousness arises, the three together is called contact. Contact has six members as well, corresponding to the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind sense. So there are six kinds of contact making up the fourth group. Then once there is this fourth group of contact, there arises a fifth group, which is called feeling or vetana. But here be very careful, feeling or the term vetana has a specific meaning, much more specific than the English word. It doesn't mean physical feeling, it means mental feeling. And second, it doesn't mean emotion. We'll talk more about this later. But there are, when there are the five kinds of, con six kinds of contact, then there are the six kinds of feeling towards those contacts. When there is feeling, then there, this, which is the fifth group, then there is the, arises the sixth group, which is called sanya. Sanya is to recognize, classify, perceive, whatever it is. When something is felt, then it is recognized, perceived. This is called sanya. There are six kinds of sanya as well, making up the fifth, uh, the sixth group. When there is recognition, then there arises the seventh group, which is called sanya jetana, which means volition volition, or which is intention, motivation. And there are six members of the group, the same six, for volition. When there is volition, then arises danha, or want, want, desire. And there are six forms of desire also, based on the six senses. That's the eighth, the eighth group. When there is desire or want, the eighth group, there arises <coughs> the ninth, which is called vitata, vitata, which is thought. When you want something, then you think about how to get it, what you're going to do, and da 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 da. So when there is want, there arises thought. And there are six types of thought in the ninth group. When there is ordinary thought, which is kind of then making the ninth group, there arises vijara. There's vitaka and then vijara. Vijara, which is can be translated discursive thought or it's it's a kind of examining, it's a much more subtle, it's the kind of thought that looks, observes, investigates things. 
There are six forms of this making up the tenth group. So there are these ten groups, and in each group there are six six members. So that means sixty things altogether. So now all of a sudden in life we have all these sixty different functions, which is really quite vast. There are these sixty different functions which can take place in life. There are the six kinds, the six sense organs, the six kinds of sense objects, the six kinds of sense consciousness, the six kinds of contact, which is sense experience, the six kinds of feeling towards experience, the six kinds of recognition or sanya, the six kinds of of intention, the six kinds of desire, the six kinds of thought, the six kinds of, of discriminating, examining thought. Altogether that's 60 different things. And each of these functions can function on its, in itself. Each of these functions has the ability to function without being a self. None of these functions is a self or the self or the soul. So we can examine all 60 of them. And if we examine them deeply, we'll realize that none of them is self. All of them are not self. All these vast and wonderful functions that make up a human life. So you can examine, investigate these things for yourself without being stuck in any particular religion. You don't have to worry about the Pali words. You can use your own terminology. Whatever works for you, examine these things how the inner sense organ is contact, is, interacts with the outer sense object. Sense consciousness arises. The three together are contact. Then feeling arises towards the contact. Recognition of the feeling towards the feeling. Then some intention regarding that recognition. And then a thought or then, then want, and then thought according to that want, and then a more detailed, subtle kind of thought follows on that. There are ten groups of six, sixty things, sixty basic functions all together. And you can study these and examine them for yourselves in order to see that each one of them functions without being a self. All of them are anatta, not self. Now it's not beyond your ability to study all of these things for yourself and to independently discover for yourself that none of these 60 things is self, that all of them are not self. In fact, it's within your potential, your ability to real, see these things well enough that you can go and teach them to your children. We'd like to challenge you in this way that you can actually understand these things enough that, to be able to teach them to your children or younger brothers and sisters or whoever. So there's the first set of six, the six elements. And we examine them to see that they none of them is self. They are all not self. 
And then we have the 60 mechanisms, the 60 automatic mechanisms arising upon the senses based on the six ayatana, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and the mind sense. And all of these automatic functions, mechanisms, are not self. This is something that we cannot do for you. It's something, but it's something within your own ability to independently examine and realize. When we can, the more we do this, the more we see that there is no self. There is life, there is body-mind, but there is no self. The more we see this, the less the self, the ego, arises, the less selfishness there is in life. That means the less problems and hassles, which means the less pain, less dukkha. So our time's just about up. Today we've talked about the six datus, elements, and uh, 60 things arising dependent upon the ayatana. So next time we'll talk about the five khandas or aggregates and how they how they arise within dependent origination. So, but for today, time is up. Thank you for your patience and attentiveness. That's all for this morning. <laughs>